Hello everybody, what's up? You're listening to I Was Just Wondering Tom Salmon, the podcast that dives into music, film and games and everything else in between. My guest on this week's episode is Ha Zhong Bo, who wrote, directed and produced his latest short film, Drifting, which tells the story of a young man struggling with his gender identity after being raised as a girl in China. Drifting had its premiere at the San Sebastian Film Festival in 2019, and it was nominated for the Best Short Film Award at the festival and was a semi-finalist at the 2019 Student Academy Awards. We jumped into Ha Zhong's experience being a math student in Beijing, making his first no-budget zombie short film, City of the Dead, and how he found his filmmaking voice at UCLA, and what it was like working as a camera operator for one of America's most celebrated film auteurs, Francis Ford Coppola. So, if you're running, stuck in a traffic jam, or sitting behind a desk at work, I hope you enjoy my interview with Ha Zhong. Um, so you're on the promotional run for your latest short film, Drifting. How's it been going so far? And what kind of promotional issues have you run into due to the COVID-19 pandemic? I didn't do much promotion, actually. Um, right now, it, in, it, the film is in the festival circuit. So mm-hmm. I'm just um, started getting more festivals. But since this COVID thing, um, I plan to travel a lot. You know, I just love to see the world with the with this film. But right yeah. now, I just visit all the festival go go to online so you know it's just pretty much just staying at home um waiting for those online festivals and really hope this covid thing can be over soon and in terms of the um online festivals i mean i should just sort of say the drifting premiered at the san sebastian international film festival last year and it was nominated for the best short film award um what was the experience like and why is san sebastian at film festival such an important one for filmmakers so i'm surprised when i when i heard of from then like my film got in um it's definitely a, one of the uh, most prestigious festival in uh in, in europe so i so i i went there it's definitely kind of you know it's a it's been the first big festival experience for me, mm-hmm. and you just get a chance to see a lot of great films and talk to your fellow filmmakers. You know, I just make friends with uh, all the other filmmakers who got into the student um, section, yeah. and yeah, it just it just makes you feel okay. You know, um, maybe you have some potential to keep making films. And yeah. what kind of films did Drifting play against in your particular block of programming when you're at the festival? We're we're in the uh, called a uh, next f- uh, film student session. It's mm-hmm. uh, it's mm-hmm. only a short film section the San Sebastian has. Yeah. So the festival invites um kind of fourteen um films from all over the world. You know, my film is the only one from um, from China and, right. and and U.S. In in terms of like the online film festivals, because uh, I assume you've submitted to uh, to a fair few of them, but in terms of getting back acceptances from that, have they told you they've gone through the process of quite how that's going to work in terms of sort of screenings and things? So most of the festival I got in, uh, they they still haven't started yet. You right. know, like you know the the most recent one should be Atlanta, and there's a Germany's one called um, uh, Film Fest Dresden. But they all postponed it, so I haven't had any um, experience with the festival playing online yet. Right. But it's gonna be soon. But they, but 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 after they told me, oh, you got in, but we are postponing the festival. At first, there is not saying, oh, we're gonna go online. Mm. But some some mm. couple of festivals they already decided we're gonna just go online, and it's gonna what happen through a, a platform they use. But some other festivals, they're still hoping to to get a real event. And I guess like one of the major benefits of attending a film festival like Sa- uh, San Sebastian is that you get to mix with other filmmakers, producers and writers and potentially build sort of like context in terms of um, furthering your career and maybe finding your next sort of opportunity. Um, exactly. d- did you make many um, good contacts at San Sebastian? I mean, I definitely make some connection but I think the most important is still, you know, just experience the festival and know your fellow filmmakers because, mm-hmm. because that you you guys basically all like you know a student at the time and you got in the same time you just party together. I mm-hmm. think that's um, you just form a friendship with you know other people around the world. It just 
you know, open up my horizon, you know. Right. So for people who haven't seen the short film yet, what's drifting about and why did you want to tell that particular story? I think the the film drifting is about, you know, those people who who's living against their will, but they um I think the essence of the film is about love and family. Um, so just sort of jumping back a little bit to the beginning of your creative journey and just to sort of find out that sort of what led you to make sort of drifting. So in terms of uh, growing up, what are the kind of films that you were into and were there any particular directors that you were really into back then and that still influence your filmmaking style today? So I had my early um, education in China and then I, um, I, w- I went to the US to study film a little bit more. Mm. So that... I, of course, at, at, the, at the beginning, like what well, f- the films in, influenced me a lot are, are films from America, you know, from Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, those films make you feel good, make you excited, make you cry. And then after college, I went to the U.S. I went, the first I went to the uh, Art, Art Institute of Chicago. Yeah. So it's art school. It's totally different than you know other you know the, the film traditional film schools you know um they just you know ask you to to reflect ask you to watch a lot of stuff i normally i won't i won't see those films in china you know i mm. for, i can't find those films in china so so i started to, to to see a lot of um you know film from europe you know and start to kind of re- watch a lot of like you know classic films I mean, at that time, one of the filmmaker, um, uh, Michael Haneke, okay, influenced, influenced me a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I love his style. You just, you just feel, you know, some f- films by the filmmaker just connect you immediately. Yeah. Um, and and at that time, I watched a lot of, you know, um, also Asian cinema. Like, you know, you you'll be surprised. Like, you know, growing up in China, all you watch are American. Film, right. I've heard some, you know, Chinese film, you know, Chinese language film, um, but some Chinese um, language director like Ho Xiao Xian, uh, Wang Kar Wai, they're mm-hmm. huge, you know, sometimes in the uh, art wars, but I don't even know that. So I mm-hmm. watch a lot of them. Um, Edward Young, Edward Young's E E, uh, the film's called E E, is uh, like one of my favorite all time. Yeah. And then I went to, um, I got in UCLA, you know, UCLA is the, the, the film school I applied at first, you know, I didn't get in, so I went to the Art Institute first, right. but I keep applying the film school, so I got in, and, and just came to the Hollywood, but I just, you know, because I, I went to that art school, you know, I don't, I started, you know, think a little bit more, I don't, you know, especially they only watch Hollywood films anymore. Even mm-hmm. I, I still enjoy watching them. Um, but like you know, before I make this film, I have to say Tarkovsky, yeah. the one influenced the most, influenced the most because I watch all his film at the time, and it just connect connect me a lot. Mm-hmm. Like the film Nostalgia, it's really have impact on me at the time. So he the one definitely I would say who influenced me the most before I made this film, you know, at the time. Right. Uh, and also Bergman at the time. And there's a lot of other film, you know, Ken Lodge and Andrea Honors. They're, they're a lot of my yeah. favorite filmmakers too. But, um, yeah, those are the filmmakers I kind of influence. Um, in terms of film and its universal sort of like nature and growing up in uh, China and I'm, I'm going to probably draw some very broad sort of generalizations in here that it's sort of like growing up in China, I'm assuming, is markedly different than, say, growing up in the UK. But it's interesting that you can gravitate towards um, Ken Loach. And was there anything, I mean, what's it about uh, Ken Loach's particular sort of cinema that really, um, that really sort of like affects you and, and that you can sort of like relate to? I mean, of course, all his films are um, like, like social, like a social, involve social issues, you know, mm-hmm. it's kind of generated from those. But it's at the other end, it's also very simple. Right. It just kind of that minimum style kind of sometimes remind me of Bresson, you know, but it, like he totally have, totally have his own touch on, on the, on the topic he's trying to, to say. Um, 
I mean, that's kind of just, you know, give me a, a aspect of, you know, okay, you, you can tell story about normal people mm. and you bring the story from some, you know, social events, but you don't make a big thing about it. You know, you just tell an honest story and it's just mm. really simple and honest. And I think um, that's something I really like. And but then uh, like you know after Ken Lodge, I mean at first I didn't watch all Ken's film you know, mm. and then mm, I got to see Andrew Honor's film like um, Fish Tank, mm. and that also hit me a lot you know I think I think you know, you know those these two directors kind of, I mean recently you know mm. really, really influenced me yeah. And just jumping back a little bit I mean what age did you get into filmmaking and did you know right away that you wanted to be a film director? I, I, I think so. I mean, I grew up, you know, my from a family like classic middle class. I think you know they and my parents. Since we're all single child, it's, it, parents put you a lot put a lot of attention on you. So from very young, I just have to study all kinds of art related yeah stuff. But not only arts, you know, I have to study English, study math. You know, I'm a math student until I'm 18, and mm -hmm. my first year is engineering. In the college in China, right. so uh, so I studied kind of math thing, but at the same time, I studied piano, saxophone, painting, these kind of things growing up. So I basically don't have time to play, and the only time I really enjoy, you know, to take can mm. take a break or take my brain off is just you know watching a film. At the uh, when I was young, you know, my, my dad only allowed me to watch film when I was having dinner at at home. So I really have a slow dinner so I can just, you know, watch the whole film. And right. Sometimes that enjoy the film also, so he just let me to watch the entire film after it, the dinner. Yeah. And when I was watching those film, I just felt like, you know, it's it's kinda of like a nature thing. So like, you know, I feel I can do those things too. You know. Um well I feel like when I'm enjoying the film, all I'm thinking is not, oh, this film's great. And all I'm thinking is like how can I make a something like this? Mm. And I think that's kind of like a, I think that's like a mindset, you know, like one, you know, there, there's something I really like. I just, you know, can learn them from watching at the beginning, you know, you just learn the basic and yeah. like driving, you know, like driving is something I, I feel I can drive before I went to a drive school, you know, those yeah. kind of things you just observing, you watching, you have passion on and you, you just want to tell something. So just jumping back to 2005, while you're studying at the Communication University of China in Beijing, you made a no-budget short film called City of the Dead. I mean, how did making that film help you in your filmmaking journey, and did that lead to big opportunities for you? Uh, oh, I don't even know. You, you, you researched that experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, um, I deep-dived. Um, let me rethink. Okay, so so during that college, that's um first of all that's not a film school, you okay. know. But the my major at the time, I I mean I transferred from my first year's engineering, um major to a uh, a film production major, and I mean, but that 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 department, the major is focuses more on on post production, you know. At the time, the the visual uh, VFX thing is is booming, you know, and people are excited about it. So I kind of studied the post-production making visual effect. But all I want to do at that time is like, I want to tell my story. So mm -hmm. so the, the City of the Dead is my, my thesis short film um, right. for, for that program. But before that, I've made some music video because I write music at the same time in, in college. Um, so toward the end of the, the school, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a big zombie film fan, yeah. actually. So, I mean, so, and, and at the time, like, you know, I was really, really in, enjoy, you know, this film, like, 28 yeah. Days Later, and that's, like, one of my favorite zombie films, and, and the, the Walking Dead, the TV shows are also very popular at the time, mm -hmm. so I'm like, okay, I want to kind of try to see if I can make a zombie film, it's kind of like my childhood dream, you know, I, yeah. I was talking with my high school friends, was planning to shoot a, a zombie film at my high school when I was, you know, before I before I graduated from high school. Yeah. And I think that feels like a dream, you know, if I want to to become a filmmaker, I want to make a zombie film. 
So, so, and, and that's also kind of like a TV pilot thing inspired by, you know, The Walking Dead, you know, at the time. So, so you know, like, you know, at the time, you know, the films I have watched is, is that the type of film. Um, but, and then, and some, some, I have three, you know, two other partners, you know, they, they, they really trust me, you know, like, yeah. I'm, a, I'm not from the department originally, but they jump in and they, they trust me. Um, I know we collaborated before, so we said, okay, let's do it. Nobody have done a zombie film at the time. Mm. So we did it. I mean, I don't know if you have watched the film yet. Yeah, I've, but... I've, I've watched it. I can't watch all of it, but I've, I've jumped and dipped yeah. and out. Yeah, but I mean, I enjoyed every minute of it. And it's kind of my first um, experience shooting narrative film anyway. Yeah. So, but that film didn't play well in China online, I would say. I mean, it played really well on YouTube. I'm surprised. Um, at the time, I have no knowledge about, you know, you have you can go to a film festival. I just put it online immediately. Yeah. And and YouTube YouTube people love it. Uh, have a lot of views, but in terms of open to my next doors for filmmaking, yeah. no, I don't think so. From what I sort of seen, um, watched the short film, it was it was involved. Like you had a lot of sort of VFX, you had a lot of sort of inserts, a lot of like camera movements. You had like cars, yeah. people, like uh, practical effects and stuff. So it seemed, um, I should say, it's sort of seventeen minutes long as well. So it's very ambitious for a for a first short film. And what's kind of interesting about sort of zombie films in general is typically with the very best of them, you know, um, George A. Romeo's um, Night of the Living mm -hmm. Dead. There's always like a, a sort of seam of social commentary that runs through those whether it be yeah. racism in the first uh, movie and then later sort of like consumerism and things like mm -hmm. this. Was that something you actually wove into that particular story yourself? Not really. You know, at that time, I don't think about those things. I just right. want to make a film that people can enjoy, but mm -hmm. I also em embrace my personal life. I mean, I shot in my own dorm. I'm just every day thinking about what happened, if, what that zombies virus happened, what if, and then what I'm going to do, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and also that film is basically just instinct for me for filmmaking because we we didn't learn anything about professional professional filmmaking. So all those inserts, you know, when to when to shoot a certain shot, I just you know by myself, you know. Yeah. So just sort of moving um, forward just a little bit. Um, so the time you sort of like finished up um, there, and then you sort of mentioned that you went to um, to Chicago. Yeah. Um, which was the school, I should say, so it's the School of Art Institution of Chicago where you earned a bachelor's degree in film, video, and new media and animation. It, we sort of spoke about it briefly, but what really are the sort of like bigger differences between sort of like higher education, between studying in, say, Beijing and like Chicago and America in terms of the study and culture? I mean, I for me, I don't, I don't think the education really can educate me about it culture is more about experiencing life right um you know like i mean when i was in beijing that that film is very socialized because all the all the people who went that film are going for like you know advertising uh tv mm -hmm. that kind of thing so it's kind of like a society itself you know it's more like a society like a first step before you go into society than other some you know tech schools Right. So, so at, at that film, it's, it's basically more about you know how to communicate with people, you know, yeah, and to making friends. And when I was in Chicago, I mean, and to be honest, I think you know if you go to, go to another country, it's really good for you to understand your own culture because mm -hmm. because when you are in that culture in that society, you're you're kind of brainwashed by brainwashed is not the right word, but you just involved in it you don't think you know objectively you know from outside the bubble you know mm -hmm. but when you, when you travel you immediately feel okay this is different than my culture what is my culture the first first thing i started yeah. saying um so when i was in Ch chicago i mean the first of, of course kind of like we, we all the foreigners call it culture shock you know i my english is not that good at the time i don't understand any you know a lot of jokes, you know, the teacher are talking, you know, and those artists, they critique my film, you know, The City of the Dead at that time, yeah. like, you know, you're really well, you know, um, technically really well done, you can tell a really good story, but what's the essence of your film, you know, mm -hmm. what's your voice, what's, as an artist, you know, you just have to have a voice, 
And at the time, I don't think about those things. And you just want to make make something people can watch and happy. And um, but when I start to get asked by the question, I start to think, okay, um, film is much more top, powerful tool than just simply making people happy. And what is my voice? Mm. And at the time, it's still you know just watching more, you know, experiencing more in the local culture and. So I make a, I wrote I wrote another script called Haircut. Um, it's a sh- another short it's a short film I made before drifting. You know, you just like embrace the life there. You know, yeah. and and from that part, most of the film I wrote is entirely based on my own experience because I think I started um, kind of trying to see what what kind of film I want to make. Yeah. And also just in, embrace the life, you know, my personal life in a different situation. Um, yeah, so I think I, I, think, I think at that time, like, you know, I, uh, there's certain films. Um, I know what kind of film I want to make. Even mm-hmm. I, I'm still not sure right now, but I mean, you, you have a idea of, you know, the power of upstart talent. And while you were studying in Chicago, you became Jennifer Reed's assistant, who's a Sundance nominated film director, artist, and lecturer. Um, her latest film, Knives and Skin, was described by the Hollywood Reporter as refreshingly weird. So, what was yeah. it like working for Jennifer, and what did you take away from that experience? Oh, well, that's basically, I mean, I was in school, you know, it's all just teaching, you know, it's learning, watching films. But when you really work for someone like her, she's, she have a big impact on me. I mean, yeah. in terms of understanding the film war in general and understanding what it feels like to be on set on a, uh, I mean, compared to professional, you know, professional Hollywood set, I think Chicago is more like outcoming. And Jennifer treated me really well at the time, you know, since I'm an intern, no, doing nothing. Yeah. But she just teach me, you know, she didn't like really teach me what, what, what is filmmaking, but you just watch her you know, filming on set. I mean, mm. at that time she already got a short called in Sundance and I watched the short. I watched all her short actually because the first job is, you know, putting some subtitles on, on all her shorts. Right. So mm. I got the chance to see her films. And and you know, she also kinda like my, my early teacher her is about the feminism. Mm-hmm. So you know everyone after I sh- a shot a film for her, she gave us everyone a, a shirt saying, you know, feminism uh, um um, as fuck, something like you know. <laughs> yeah. She's a just really cool person, and 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 just you know watching her on set, you know the way she, a director to can encourage people, encourage your crew, encourage the people who is working hard, and encourage and communicate with the actors. Yeah. And it just really like you know influenced me. You know even you know my style might be a little bit different than hers, hmm. um, but she told me okay. Um, this is what a director should do, and this is an indie indie filmmaker at the time, you know, should do. Mm. And uh, we were working for her film uh, called um, Crystal Lake. I think she, the film went to Berlin. Right. We we, we still kind of come uh, sometimes we'll interact, you know, through Instagrams. When her, when her new film came to LA for a premiere, I always you know went to went to see the premiere, and mm. I, I'm still. Good friend with um, the cinematographer of the film, Chris. Uh, Chris, you know, so we are still in in, in touch. You know, that's kind of for me. It's like you know, it's a very warm learning experience. Yeah. And she has a very um, unique uh, point of view, which I think is um, which is important for a filmmaker in terms of finding your voice. She has a very quite particular and unique um, voice. And from what I understand of her work, she does sort of critique um, American culture. Um, and I just yeah. wondered through that, did that make you reassess um, perhaps your own perspective on when you where you sort of like were brought up and how that could be sort of like woven into film? Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, all her films, I think she's also drawing from her own experience. Mm. You know, you know, that's something like you know really also encouraged me to to think back about my personal life mm-hmm. and. You know, in that sense, I know she's from Ohio. I think, um, I mean, her views on American 
Americans in general and also America is so so have a huge impact on me mm-hmm. as well. Um, so just following on from that, um, as you sort of spoke about, you went to UCLA in uh, 2015 and you studied a master's degree in film directing. And around the same time, you worked as a camera operator for Francis Ford Coppola on his film Distant Visions. So how did mm. you get that job and what was it like working for one of America's most famous auteur filmmakers? Oh, well, you know, at first, I'm just super happy and excited. So so how I got into to the job is um, it's funny, you know, Coppola is a... Uh, alumni from UCLA, you know, our program. So I think at the time, you know, just suddenly the school sent out emails like, oh, no, Coppola going to want to work with us, you know, to to kind of shoot his new new project. Yeah. And we'd love to see if there are any students who want to to apply this. You know, of course, all the, all, all the students are going to apply for it. Yeah. I mean, the, because it, it's not like entirely Film. It's. I mean, it's a film, but it's more experimental. It's called live cinema. You can, re, you can, you can, you know, read, read somewhere online. Right. So, you know, and you know, using the television um, technique, you no, know, it's all everything's live. Mm-hmm. But there's editing. You know, it's basically ed- real editing live and broadcasting yeah. a, a film, a story. You know, we're we're, we're shooting well. We're shooting. Um, and the set is changing during the commercial. So when we when the when the commercial is over, we get back to the story. It's another scene, that kind of thing. And it says it's an ex- experimental film, and he needs to shoot in a in a in a in a in a, in a big stage. And the UCLA have a stage. So he's you know I'm gonna come to UCLA, and I'm gonna entire film you know most of the crew i'm gonna hire um students you know from mm-hmm. ucla you know i think he's trying to give back you know kind of more you know using this experience to to collaborate with students and he's you know to teaching you know in that sense so so since you know the nature of the film needs a lot of you know like you know in for them i mean the camera operating team yeah we have 18 people i think for the camera operator but of course the the head of the uh, uh, cinematography department, is, his name's Miha, you know, he shot uh, the master, you know, he's a really, really nice guy. And yeah. we learned a lot from him. And and, and just being on set watching um, Coppola is just a joy, you know, and he's also a very, very nice person, you know, really easy to talk. And he's mm. always trying to give back to the student, talk about his past experience. So I think I remember the most, um, I think the most useful thing is that um, I mean he talked about his experience, you know, getting be the director of you know uh, the Godfather. Yeah. He he said you know you know at the time he Marlon uh, Brandon is just very supportive to him, and at that time he's just a new director. Yeah. I mean if he doesn't have that support, he might not get a job. You know, he's trying to to cause you know the um, uh, Pacino right, mm. but. The studio doesn't support the idea, so he just like you know going back with you know back and forth with. But the most important thing he said, you, you have to get your actors to to support you, you know. And sometimes yeah. on set you just have to be really close with your actors because they they perform, they're they're doing that the the acting sometimes for something for someone, mm-hmm. and most of the thing that is for for direct for the director, and. So um, that's something like I started, you know, the thing. I mean, I, I don't want someone to influence my entire filmmaking. Like I'm going to copy a Coppola, but yeah. I have my own, you know, method. But but that that thing really, you know, make me understand the relationship between the director and the actors. And I think that's very important. And also just, you know, watching Coppola, you know, directing and being on set, what kind of a present he is. Mm. He was, you know, he just um, to constantly make me thinking about, you know, what the director should do, and yeah, so it's a great experience. Was he particularly hands-on with his with his actors and the people that he was sort of like working with? I mean, I imagine there's a great sort of deal of um, respect to him, but were they able to sort of like feedback and say, "Hang on a minute, um, Francis, m- you know, maybe you might want to go a little bit of a different direction on on this." Was he was he open to sort of feedback? So I mean, during the film, you know, we we as a you know like 
like we work as a camera operator, we don't get a chance to, you know, to talk to him a lot right. because he didn't give any direction directly to us. He he, he communicated with head, his head of the, all the other departments like bars and camera. So, but I mean, but at that time, because we were like a live show, so we everyone have a um, right. kind of headset, you know, so we, we, we can hear, um, you know, the way he communicate. He's just very nice, general, mm. gen, uh, uh, gentleman, you know, he, he never screamed, I think. He, yeah. I think there's a, only one time he's not happy, like we're shooting a big, you know, uh, big blue, uh, blue screen backdrop thing. It's, it's a period piece, so it just uh, involves uh, a lot of you know, um, uh, like extra actors and and I think I think I, I think, and it's supposed to be a rainy day, I think. But yeah. I think the art department doesn't want him to to wear the whole set, you know, the whole whole stage. Like you just, they just you know using that thing, flowering the flowers and the plants just to. To, to to give a, a touch on the, some water thing <laughs> and Nicole is not happy like I don't I want a big ring you know that's what kind of ring is that yeah and he got a little bit impatient and he, and he just keep pushing the art department okay more water more water and then you know the, the end result is entirely different than the, the reason you know the whole set is yeah. raining and it's raining waters and then he's happy you know he he just mm-hmm. that, had definitely have a passion on the the, the the thing he really want to do, yeah. But also, I mean, even he's huge. But when you're really working for someone, you know, I mean, the status of that thing at the beginning, you know, you admire him. It is is real. It's true. But later on, you know, you can still hear some people complain. You know, it's still like you're in you know, a normal set. Every crew yeah. members will kind of gossip or critic, you know, you know, the way director do it. And that I learned that too. Also, okay, you know, when you get on set, the director job is not making everybody happy. Mm-hmm. You know, the director's job, you know, doing his job to realize his vision. And that sometimes will make people unhappy. I think I think that art art people dripping the rings, they're not happy at the moment because they're a target. You know, everybody's quiet mm-hmm. and couple of just talk to okay, art depending on what you guys are doing. But then you realize, okay, you know, you can't make everybody happy. You do, the most important is just to get the work done. And I think um, that's very, very important. And, but, the, you know, during not filming, he's just a normal, nice guy. You know, yeah. I, I, I get the chance to talk to him, you know, personally when he's, you know, in the in the loading dock and he's just relaxing himself, you know, just st- sitting at a stair alone, Nobody, nobody's talking to him. He's mm. just staring. You know, he's just like letting his mind out. I think, and I'm, at the time, like I don't want to, you know, disturb him. You know. Yeah. But then, okay, this is one of the chance in my life is to talk to him. So I just want to talk to him. He, and he, 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 he been to China. You know, he knows a little bit about China. And yeah. We, we just talked. Um, just really, really nice person. Wow, is that a? Uh, <laughs> is that a motorbike in the background? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. It's, really, <laughs> it's, a, to... no, it's not, a, um, not a problem. I just wondered if you could still um, hear me over the noise. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so it just sort of summing up that particular period in your life when you were sort of like in higher film education for sort of 2019 all the way to sort of 2018. I mean, how do you think your artistic and technical skills sort of grew over that period? And what do you think was the biggest benefit and drawback from choosing that sort of film um, educational pathway, in your opinion? I mean, at first, you know, if you went to a traditional film school, technically they just t- teach you, you know, how to shoot a film, you know, how to mm. tell a story. I think they're teaching you a, a language, you know, but in the U.S., I mean, it, sometimes it means a, a specific language. Yeah, it's more like Hollywood style um, involved. You know, the, it really depends on who's your teacher at the time. So, so. So, but I learned them basic, you know, it's very important to lo- to know those basic rules of, you know, the cinematic language and then you can yeah. break it. But I mean, since I always enjoy all kinds of films, you know, and it's very experimental, experimental film from art school. I have a different expert, you know, how, you, how to use those language into storytelling. Um, so that's why um, drifting is a little bit, you know, 
different than normal, you know, you know, editing, you know, back and forth, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that's definitely, I know that I think the, the good side is like you make a lot of friends, you know, who also want to be a filmmaker. And, and I think in this, for the career, I, I really feel, you know, you, you need someone to, to talk to, to, to support it, to, to get notes. You know, who who also want to be a serious filmmaker, yeah. and I think film school um, give you that environment. You know, you can get get it somewhere somewhere else. You know, you know, you just have to keep always researching people if you're out out there. Mm. But as, you know, film school is a safe environment for you to um, to kind of realize your voice. But I think the backdrop is just I'll say, I mean, you're you're. Use your habits, or your the something you 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 like becomes your life, you know. Mm. And it almost feels like I mean, it's not like you know you learn from you learn uh, something different, and you you can enjoy the cinema, and purely. But yeah. but right now, you know, you just have to um, to watch a film, and, and start to think a lot of things, <laughs> like how to make the film, how the story come up. It's just a little bit different than you know you becoming a normal audience, but but mm. the same I'm always telling me you know just try to think as a normal audience at the time. You just take your brain up, just purely enjoy the film because that experience is very important too. I think mm. as a film, and and the other job job drawback I think is like you know you just no way back. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. yeah. If I have my undergrad from another major, like for example, if I just keep doing engineering in my college, maybe you know, you you, you can go back to something something else other than film because then film is very um, different career. Mm. But now you know you you basically just have to go forward. You know you, you just this is kind of like a tunnel view. You know you just have to do certain things to 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 write a story and make a film. That kind of thing. So, so right now I'm more like you know trying to not limit limit my life, you know, right. only on the filmmaking side. It's more about experiencing the world and you know making friends with other you know the people not related to the film. Um. So now let's sort of deep dive into your latest short film, uh, Drifting. So Drifting is set in rural China. So just to frame the film's location and story, uh, I just want to learn a little bit about your relationship with your sort of home country, which you sort of speak about briefly. Now I've spoken to a few young Chinese men and women who've studied and worked abroad, and they have sort of like mixed feelings on the country's political and economical and social direction at the moment. And I think that's because they can look at these issues from from an outside uh, perspective. So for you, um, what concerns you most as a filmmaker? Um, what do you think about the problems facing China at the moment? I mean, first, when I'm starting to make this film mm. or write this film, I didn't think about, you know, those kind of social issues. Social issues is for me, it's just more, um, you know, when it's really impacting on my life or my friend's life, I start to think about it. Yeah. But the original of the film, uh, it's a fight scene, you know, that fight scene really happened to me. Like, you know, that's a year before I wrote this story. Like, mm. I was uh, I was in China, you know, visiting my family in Beijing during the summer break. And the right the, the day before I got to fly back to the U.S., I, I went to play basketball with my parents on, on the other side playing badminton. You know, our mm. family like to do some support uh, sport because we think that's very important. And I'm, I'm a very competitive person, and when playing basketball, um, um, I got into involved in a fight with right. you know the five or six other people. At the time, I don't know they're all together. So we we got into a fight, and and since the day before I go back, I don't want to cause the trouble. You know, so like the, mm. the but the, the mm. other guys really started cursing a lot. You know, it's like and it involved my my parents. You know, those words, and I start to get really pissed. And yeah. then I think they're they're like six people they're trying to bully me you know mm. and also, you know asian looks really young sometimes and my face looks really <laughs> innocent as i feel so they think they can take advantage of me they don't know i you know i'm pretty strong yeah um so i will get i got circled by them at the time and my my parents they're playing you know with 
their friends, you know, on the other side of the court. Yeah. And they saw, and my parents saw me get circled, and they just break in the circle. And kind of fight with me against those wow. other, and and I I remember you know my mom got thrown on the ground because she's trying to stop a person who is trying to punch me from my back. Right. And I heard my my mom's like you know scream a little bit of like you know ouch, mm. and and then I'm like you know that I never I mean my, I feel my whole body got numb you know it's just crunk crunch you know it's like. Yeah, I never. I'm that angry before, and I just started talking to the guy who's you know throw my mom, mm. and I think I was just you know my your when your your body is just totally numb and using so much strength. So I I just jump on that person, but I jumped, and he 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 ducked. So he he, he I didn't really really jump on him. Yeah, but before I fall on the floor, I. Gotta grab his shirt and you know throw him, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I remember I throw him really, really far, and and I like I'm like, I said, okay, okay. Did I am I this strong at the time? You know, like you know, you just, but you know the energy of the anger mm. makes me think this. You know, the pure you know experience of you know love. And at the time, I don't really talk with my parents a lot. You know, they always mm. tell me talk to them. But once this kind of situation came up, you know, they just the first one sacrificed themselves to to jump in. And, yeah, yeah. And and the experience is the original one. Want make me want to make this film. Right. Wow. And, yeah. And, and then, you know, I started. So so that's the time I did make the decision. Okay, my sixth film I'm gonna make a film about this experience about my parents about the family in China. You know. Mm-hmm. Um. And then. I started to rethink about my life, you know, what's the most important thing for me. I mean, I think our generation, uh, the one child, gener- mm. you know, generation, everyone have a one child in the family. I think that's a huge impact for for family. You know, it changed a lot of things. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what that experience, you know, under a lot of pressure, a lot of expectation from your parents. Mm. And I think I put that in the film. But it, before... Before I'm, before I'm, like, I think I, I went back to China five or six months before filming because mm-hmm. I want to go back to the place and experience the life there. You know, I, I don't think I can make a film in China like a, one month before I go back because, yeah. I mean, being in the U.S. for a long time, I need to go back to kind of embrace the culture again and doing research. So when I was doing research, you know, I heard a story about my friends telling me about this, um, this his friend, you know, it's yeah. like he got dressed up as a girl growing up, and his teenagers, he's a little bit struggling with his um, identity. Yeah, and that yeah. really also hit me, you know, like, and I started to research the um, what happened, you know, during the during the period, you know, the most strict period, you know, those of the time when I was born mm-hmm. and and actually some similar things happens you know like you know because because since everybody only can have one child and it's not necessarily every, every family secretly have a second child that's not always the case yeah but people yeah. always expect their the kid to be a little bit different you know like some family like girls and they have a boy end up so they mm-hmm. dress the boy as a girl you know, and sometimes it's opposite. And I, I, I think like, you know, I think that thing only happens at that time sometimes because people are limited and they, and also they're trying to find a way to kind of, kind of hide it to, to fight back. You know, that's mm. some, some people have the girl, but they, they send the girl away or hide the girl so they can secretly have another. Yeah. Um, so those story, um, I start to kind of think about like you know like my protect me because when I was writing the story I didn't kind of limited my what 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 my protect me is you know I want right. to embrace the the journey of doing research so that story just come into my um my mind and then I mean also the experience of drifting you know like mm. you know some of my friends they they just enjoy. Um, they're a car drifters. They're also specialized filming car stunts stuff. Yeah. 
And during my high school, so friends, so they put me in a car. That's also way before um, writing the story. Um, I just enjoy the experiment in a drifting car because it feels like freedom. You know, it's, mm. it's drift is it's like events. You basically control the your car losing control. Yeah. So it's on the edge, and I think that felt feeling is like very similar to a, a character, my tr- protagonist mm. feeling. And also, I want to make a film for a little bit younger audience. You know, for my generation, things I like. You know, I don't care about other people. You know, older people think what it is but i just want to make, make, make a film people also can enjoy you know you know um so i decided to kind of put the drifting in my film because i also like cars too what's yeah, interesting about the um drifting element is because my experience is sort of like drifting i guess is from like fast and furious Tokyo drift so it seems like hyper masculine um yeah. in terms of and but then also you've got this this young uh, man who's actually in conflict with his own sort of ide- identity and sort of the femininity that's been forced onto him um, by his yeah. parents to hide his sort of like true identity. So it's a weird sort of like, not weird, but it's an interesting juxtaposition between those two, two the worlds, between a very hyper masculine and a very sort of like feminine, which I thought um, was a very interesting uh, thing. Yeah, totally. You know, you know, people will think, you know, the masculine, you know, like, you know, the fast and fluid, you know, the guy always look like that when they're doing car drifting, mm. but they're. Those are totally, you know, stereotype, you know, where Hollywood, you know, like my friends, they're not like that. They're just normal guys. They just mm-hmm. love, you know, drifting because drifting for them is a way out. Yeah. And, and talking about, hearing them talking about the experience, why they love drifting. And drifting is not like an expensive events thing, you know, only rich people can do that. It's, they're just normal kids. Mm. And, and so I totally see my, my, my protagonist doing that. And also, and I think, I think, and I, but to be honest, right be, before I find my actor, I still don't have a really kind of grasp on, you know, what, what the, who the protagonist is. Mm-hmm. And here I find my actor because at the time, I can't really find any, I think that's a something, you know, I learned from US, but I can't really realize, realize it in, the, in, the, in China is that the, the, the quality of the pro- professional actors, you mm. know, like US or maybe in the, uh, the UK, you do auditions, um, you, you get to know a lot of really good actors from auditions. But in China, I can't find someone who's really convinced me to play the, play the role. Yeah. So I started went on, on street casting, you know, I just, you know, take a walk every day and go to take on a bus or a subway. Yeah. And I found my, my guy on the subway, you know, and he's just a kid, like 17. He never act before. I just approached him like, hey, do you want to come to my audition? I'd love to um, to to give you a chance to see. I'm a student, film student yeah. from the U.S. And he's really happy to to take a take a take a try. And 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 it's and I, th- I think he, like, after that, like, we start to not not rehearsal because at the first I didn't tell him I'm going to cuss you. You know, it's yeah. more like you know, get to know each other, know his pa- parents. And and he's going through a very um, different but also typical teenaging identity experience. You know, he's constantly doubting himself. He's what he's, um, yeah, so that's basically it. A journey of you know how to make a film in China. You just um, street go street casting. I, w- I would just imagine you walking up to this chap on the on the subway going, "Hey kid, do you want to be in a film? Come to my audition." Because I think in the uh, in the UK, if you were to approach somebody like that, they'd be like, "What?" They think they, they, they yeah. automatically think it was sort of some sort of suspect um, was going on, and then t- until you can sort of like convince them and say, "Hang on, no, this is legitimate. This isn't you know another kind of movie. This is like a real like movie that I'm um, I'm making." I mean, I mean, in the U.S., in you know, China, it's the same. You know, just mm. a lot of people. I'm, I'm lucky. I didn't, you know, have to cause a, a girl. You know, mm. you know, like because I'm a guy. Like if I just go go to, on the street and talk to a girl, hey, I want to, you know, make have you on, in my film, they're gonna think I'm crazy. But but this kid, you know, he, there's something special about him. You know, yeah. it's just like when I saw him, he just stand out. You know, from the entire, you know, subway. Um, so I'm just really lucky to find him, to mm-hmm. be honest. And I also find some other people on the street. I, I told, I, I, I found like four, three or four 
people from the street. Um, at the time, I just compared them constantly, you know, constantly meeting them. And I just feel this kid is right. He's maybe not a you know, open open person because he never act and he, his body is strict. You know, I never said he can do the dancing before. Right. But, yeah. You know, but and but the funny thing, the music, I've, you know, in the dancing, it's also I found it from the street costume because one of the, the street cast person I almost cause he's a musician. Mm-hmm. And so I, but I didn't end up casting him, but his music really, I told him, show me your music. And he showed me this music and said, okay, that's a very interesting piece. I really like, um, I'm thinking maybe I get a chance to put it in my film. Mm. But I mean, this is another story about film and that dancing, you know, I don't know if you want to know. Yeah, sure. Cool. Please tell me. So, so, the, so the dancing origin is not like this. The music is entirely different, you know, mm. like because um, I'm not sure he. Be, I mean, the the scene itself is, you know, I want to kind of express his feeling. It's he's basically in, in his mind. He mm. can be free, and he's picturing, you know, his dance with a family. You know, it's a beautiful, uh, relaxing moment. But since you know, my 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 my, my guy, he he's not a, like a very very you know he's a little bit self-conscious you right know, moment so i'm like okay i have to do research re- rehearsal with him on the dance so we found a so originally i i plan to use a very traditional chinese sound mm-hmm. it's a really slow dance move and i found a dance teacher to kind of help me to loosen him up you know to to make him you know comfortable with body with movement yeah. So we rehearsed all the entire thing, you know, and we planned certain even um, dance moves. And and it, and it, and it, and it, before the, the day before I'm shooting that dancing, I make him practice again about the filming. So I told him, you know, you practice now, but on set you just forget your move, you know, just freely move yourself. But mm. I'm gonna prepare another sound for you. Um, you just have to improvise it. Um, but I'm not gonna show you right now. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna listen on on set. Mm. So that we filming the entire um, the old plan, you know, the old uh, slow downs, and he did that. But I'm like, you know, I want some surprise. I don't want to, you know, limit to something I rehearsed so many times. Mm. So, I, so I, so I told him, okay, from now you're on your own, and you just, you know, forget yourself, you know, forget your body, just ex- experience it. And then I changed that sound to this, the sound that this. You know dance music yeah and he did it you know like you know because i, I was planning like you know if you can if he can do it you know i'm fine i have a safe take you know yeah yeah like he totally surprised me as a non-actor before you know mm-hmm. and i think that's involved some trust in yeah. me you know and i and i i'm just totally you know blown away by his willingness to to give 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 out himself to that certain level mm. and I'm and, and really moved by the by the dancing. What I wanted to jump into a little bit actually was a particular um, scene that I was sort of curious about and I wondered if you'd just give me like a little bit of a director's uh, commentary on that because it sort of really fascinated me. So um, there's a, a pivotal scene when uh, Yan confronts his parents before he's going to leave home. And I just, mm. just if you could just walk me through some of your directorial choices. So from, from what I noticed from the notes that I made was that um, that the camera is sort of locked off and it's away from the actors. Um, the scenes centre framed and the actors are covered in one take. And I was very curious about why you particularly sort of chose to approach that scene in that way. I mean, the the way to shoot it, I was inspired by the environment. Mm-hmm. I mean, the window, the door, the separation. You know. Um, you just you know kind of stay stay step back and you just observe them from an angle mm. and i i think the you know the graphically the different windows separate different person and that i mean when i was doing re, uh, location re, uh scouting you know that's something like always keep in mind maybe that that you know that composition can fit into this thing but once writing a story you know this you know, just slapping himself. Mm. I think it's, I I think I draw from my, my personal experience. You know, right. sometimes you 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 fight with the parents. You you just 
you just communicate you just there's no way to communicate you know the mm-hmm. only thing is like kind of self-destroying to make them feel painful mm-hmm. and that's kind of like a dynamic i think a lot of children you know universally you know experience you know just like you know if you want your parents to listen you sometimes have to to hurt yourself or you, you walk away mm-hmm. you know um so 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 the, so so the way to approach that thing is coming from that you know personal experience. Yeah. But um, talking with my actor at the time, I think I remember I talked to him. Okay, this is the moment you should release all your anger. Um, since I don't allow you to speak any lines in the entire film, mm-hmm. I have to use anything you can to kind of make. And I also I talk to the dad, you know, you don't, you're not allowed, allowed to look at him, you know, yeah. once he's eating. So I told him, my, my actor, like, you know, you have to do everything you can just to draw your dad attention at the, at the time. So he, he just improvised a little bit, right. you know, beat himself and involved it with the mom, you know, the mom, the one always empathy was his own son. And why was it important for you that scene be entirely scored by the sound of the bubbling fish tank? Um, I mean, that's also inspired on set, you know, right. like, first of all, we can't really turn off that fish thing. Mm-hmm. And I also find it's very interesting, like, because the, the, the fish tank, that kind of bubbling thing, towards the end, when we camera push into the father, we you know all the tension on the father. And I, I feel that sound kind of really imply his, you know, inner, inner, in her voice, like, you know, he, you know, ob- obvious, you know, until, until his sons have left, you know, he, act, you know, finally can really look at his son, you know, even his son's gone. And he's, mm-hmm. in other words, it's like a boiling water, that kind of thing. I think, I think the sound turns to a boiling water sound to, towards later when we do the sound design. Yeah. And also kind of, um, crossway to that the hor- the herd of the sheep mm-hmm. and you know that's something you know we capture on set but we in the pose we realize that we can really you know make use of that right um, and i just want to jump into a little bit into the cinematography here for a moment i mean you worked with dutch cinematographer i'm probably going to butcher his name jolie van horn i think yeah, um, jolie jolie van Hovo. um so you worked with him on City of the Dead. I mean, did you have did he did he have like a particular look and color scheme in mind before you started filming um, the short film? So I and Joey we worked you know on the City of the Dead. At the time, we were both senior students, you know, from different schools. He's mm-hmm. from the Beijing Film Academy, uh, but you know, and then I just go abroad, and he just keep watching working in the Chinese industry, and he have done couple of features, you know, got really good reviews, you know, he's a, you know, working in the industry, cinematographer, mm-hmm. I know, and, but we, we sometimes will communicate, and he knows I was studying at uh, UCLA, it's a really good film school, so bef- and I, so before, um, I just, you know, get touch with him, like, hey, you know, this is my thesis film, um, and the story is like this, mm-hmm. do you want to, to work on it. I mean, at the time, like, since I haven't worked in, in China for so long, you know, I don't know the kind of how to work a, a film set. Right. I need someone who understand that, but also have a, a, a little bit, you know, outside people. He, since, you know, he's from he's from Netherlands, but he worked in the China, so he, he can understand both, you right. know. I think he, he's a perfect per- person to kind of to do the film, but I mean, you know, Chinese film industry, or sometimes a little bit like Hollywood, you know, they, they tend to make everything look the same. Right. I think he felt that at the time he had done, you know, you know, all the commercials, all the work, you know, looks are very similar. Mm. <clears throat> so I told him, like, I want something different at this time <clears throat> because I want, because I want this film to feel really realism. So I asked him, like, if there's a way we don't use any film lights in the film. We just capture what it has on set for mm-hmm. the practical lights. And I just want to see the beauty of the reality, you know, what the, what the, what it really is with those, you know, light. And he said, yeah, let's do it because I'm tired of a lot of traditional things. I want mm-hmm. to do that. So uh, we agree 
of course we, we share you know some you know reference but we agree that you know most of the things we don't use any film like that at all so right. so but i think the only film that we use is is after the the the, the house collapse you know in that yeah. dark we only use one film like because there's no way to let to to see things in that scene that entirely dark but all the other scenes we didn't use any film light it's all practical mm. so um that's the the look we decided before we're filming and in regards to that like you you know filming yeah and drifting in the taxi on that empty stretch of road i mean did you run into sort of like major problems when you were sort of like filming and i mean how did you sort of like mount the camera on the car and also film him while he was in the in the driver's seat as well that's kind of interesting to me i mean mounting a camera on a car is, is not that hard anymore you know mm. they just you know mounted it on the in the front of the the car the one we were shooting that day uh car scenes we're drifting a car we drive the car in a in a kind of like an airport you know abandoned airport right so it's it's an openness you know and also drifting a car doesn't require the high speed mm. you just make the other circle a simple one and just very easy um so so during the night thing you know when was the families in the car there's yeah. all re- there's all really him drifting the car and you can see the parents face are really <laughs> like you know scaring i think we captured that yeah. but but you know at the same time we we guarantee everybody's safe you mm-hmm. know we have sounds constantly there but the last shot the fireworks that requires a, a, a higher level of driving skill than mm-hmm. drifting skill, and that's um a, a car stamp is driving right i think he's drifting in his dad's old taxi car i believe oh, yeah. um, i would just wonder where you got the car from oh the from my, my friends you know they're drifting their cars so i actually used my friend's car and then we painted it all red mm. and make it look like old uh like a uh a, a volkswagen and car and and put a taxi logo right. on it you know that's a art department's work but i mean all the drift cars are are very, very old. You know, they are not allowed to on the road anymore. So they 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 just you know only use it for drifting. And mm-hmm. they, the the old look also um, sync with you know the old taxi we're picturing. So we were lucky to find the car and, and you know do it. Um, and also just one sort of scene that I just want to draw um, some attention to as well was I was particularly struck by the light by the lighting the fight scene on the bridge, but the card lights are actually underneath the. Um, Bridges railings. Uh, it looked otherworldly yet sort of mundane in a very sort of strange way. And what kind of put in mind of what Harmony um, Corinne does in a lot of his movies, like he'll put coloured lights under, hidden away under sort of like objects, and you'll get that sort of really nice sort of like really otherworldly sort of like glow. And I just wondered, you know, picking that particular location, was that something you kind of had in mind as those sort of lights change colour and the fight sequence and that sort of stuff? Yeah, I, I mean. I was always amazed everybody every time I go back to China, you know, there's so many lights, you know, mm-hmm. in the city, you know. I mean the, the, the lights on the bridge it wasn't there on that bridge. You know, that's but the, there's a lot of other similar bridge with mm-hmm. that kind of light. I'm like, okay, this is like a tunnel to me. It's like, yeah. you know, you, you kinda go through a a tunnel in your life, you just you know, from this side to the other side, you know, I think this is kinda like a of a, 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 at first, I want this bridge to be a metaphor. Mm. You know, every time he go to the other end, you know, he can drive the car. But every time he go back to this end, there's bullets waiting for him. There's family waiting for him. So this bridge is important for him. So that's why he always kind of, you know, space out in, on the bridge, you know, mm. to kind of ease himself. And then the, this light is for me, it's just, I, I just fully immersed by, by the, the, the bridge, you know, the, yeah. having that. I'm talking to my art department. Going, this is a light I really want to use on the bridge. Um, so we just put it there. Right. Oh, okay. So you lit the whole of the um, the bridge that way. Yeah. We. Oh, wow. they, I think they just purchased that the light on on uh, online and just mm. put it on the bridge. It's not like a very very um, difficult thing. Right. And then just one sort of final question on the cinematography. I, I just wonder why you choose um, chose the sort of aspect ratio of one point seven eight, which I believe in the US or the UK is sixteen by nine. Okay. Did you notice there's a, a aspect ratio change from four by three to nineteen by nine? 
in the in the film yeah no i didn't know um i was just looking at the um imdb sort of what it's listed in the aspect ratio on there but i wasn't aware there were one that's changed so why was it why did you sort of like change the uh the aspect ratio yeah i, I mean the the the, the time of the, the ratio change is when the door collapsed right uh, when the parents fight for him and then he get back you know to find out how this gone. but that's the moment like you know we don't care anymore because the families are back together mm -hmm. That's a moment for me. It's kind of a big releasing moment, you know, for the main protagonist. So, so the aspect for me is like more his inner inner war. Like you know, before mm. but three is a really like constrained, restricted, you know, feeling because the the film at before is also you know about his pain and his inner self. Yeah. But that after the bridge is such a big release for him. And he feel he have a family again. You know, he he knows that you know in this world I'm a, I'm not alone. Yeah. And I think we're I'm using that the door collapse kind of to 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 have that um, natural aspect ratio change. You know, a lot mm. of people didn't know that when they watched the film. It's just totally natural from four by three to sixteen by nine. Right. And and I and I like that. You know. And after after that, just you know, family get back together, and he put his parents in the car, um, drifting. I think that after that, you know, the, all those scenes are about, you know, family reunited. Mm. So just sort of like looking back at the um, filming sort of like process and all that kind of thing, is there a scene or moment you wish you could go back and reshoot for any reason? Mm, not really. I mean, to be honest, this, this film surprised me a lot. Right. You know, first I embraced the uh, improvising. You know, so the actor mm -hmm. constantly surprised me, and I re really enjoy that. You know, like in the U.S., people be, like to plan everything. Right. And I like to plan everything too, but also I feel this film I allow myself to not restrict myself my previous mindset. You know, just embrace a lot of things happens on set mm. so there's some you know there's a lot of you know you know accident like you know the dance for me is an accident and right. the heart of the sheep is an accident we didn't plan that so so i, I think this, a lot of things are surprised surprised me and yeah um, and also the the car drifting you know like you know the, the people are on the, in the corner of the the frame when during the daytime he's drifting that's because drifting the the, the rig that put on the car drift away a little bit you know because, and that's an accident too so so i kind of like i liked every every moment of the filming you know there's right. no you know at, at least for now maybe a couple years later i can I can rethink about the film to feel okay. This one can do better, but but um, for now I don't have any. Okay. Um, and just a sort of final question on the sort of uh, production sort of like process. Once you sort of locked the edit and finished post production, I mean, how quickly did you start sending off drifting to film festivals? I think right away. I mean, I think I would start to submit while we are still working on the sound. You know, I have. Yeah. I've done a couple of versions of sound. I'm always not satisfied with it. So, so but the festival can't wait. So I just um, during the post I already already started submitting. Yeah. Um, and just sort of finally, I mean, how would you sort of personally and professionally measure the success of drifting moving forward in this sort of post COVID nineteen world? That's really thrown sort of like filmmaking, film festivals, and cinema upside down. And um, do you think it will have like a negative effect on the film at all as you sort of progress forward? Um, and I, I don't particularly think the film is a, a successful at the moment, mm -hmm. you know, I just feel it represent myself, you know, yeah. it's a film truly, I realize my voice, you know, no matter people like it or not, it just, it's my film. Mm -hmm. And, and since the film has already got into first film festivals, the, the, the rest of it is just, you know, um, keep submitting it, put it out there, but I already... I'm trying to be away with this film, mm. and preparing my next film. So I'm writing my um my my first feature right now. Yeah, and it's gonna set in the U.S. story. 
um, but also preparing to shoot a couple more short films. You right. know, I, think, I don't want to get stuck in this one thing because you have worked on this film since like two years ago. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time. I just want to get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah. always you want to move on to the next thing because the next thing is more exciting. So just finally, my final question for you is that what's your dream project if money and time wasn't an issue for you? Um, I want to make a... I mean, there's so many films I want to do, you know. I want to do films in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I want to do a film about my family, you know, <clears throat> the history with the history of my family, my grand-grandfather until now right you know that kind of thing because those kind of epic time passing thing i like to film deal with with time and i think the history if you have a family history no matter it's it's a big history you have from a noble family or mm. just a normal family i want to just portray a chinese normal family how they pass on their their you know, legacy, you know, from generation to generation, I think mm -hmm. um, that's something I want to do. So there you have it. I had a great time chatting with Harjong. And you can follow and watch his short film work on Vimeo.com. Just hit the link in the description box below. And don't forget to check out some more great content on Rubler.com from film reviews to video game hot takes to top 10 videos. And why not sign up and become a member and share your passion for all things entertainment on Rubler.com today. You can like and subscribe to I Was Just Wondering with Tom Salmon on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify and YouTube, and maybe leave a comment or review if you like. And you can support the podcast on Subscribestar at www.subscribestar.com forward slash I Was Just Wondering with Tom Salmon right now. Thank you so much for listening to I Was Just Wondering with Tom Salmon. I've been Tom and I'll catch up with you next episode. <laughs>